Hello, and welcome to our series, Conversations on Zionism, Reclaiming the Narrative. I'm Russell Robinson, Chief Executive Officer of Jewish National Fund USA. The time has come to be the voice of what Zionism really is. We're exposing the beautiful and diverse facets and facts of Zionism. Join me on this journey, together with Conversations on Zionism, Reclaiming the Narrative, this is Zionism. My guest today is Rabbi Yeshua Fass, co-founder and president of Nefesh Benefesh, the organization that revolutionized Aliyah to Israel for over 70,000 people from North America. Nefesh Benefesh and Rabbi Fass have made moving to Israel a reality for so many. He is with us today to talk about absorbing the thousands and expected hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians and Russians who will be looking to relocate to Israel, to our ancestral soil. Coming home, what a Zionist story. Please welcome Rabbi Fass. Rabbi Josh Fass, welcome to ZTV, to the Zion Studios. Thank you for talking to us from Yerushalayim, the capital of the Jewish people. I'm going to go right into a question. In 2013, you were the commencement speaker at Yeshiva University. You talked about the miraculous moment in time that we were in. Tell me about then and now. Russell, thank you so much for having me on. At that commencement speech, I mentioned that we should all marvel in the majesty of the miracle of the modern day state of Israel. And I believe that that is true. After centuries of dreaming, praying, yearning for our own land, for the return of the Jews to their homeland, we're experiencing that miracle. Sometimes in the form of Aliyah of choice, which I've been involved in for the last 20 years, and sometimes Aliyah of Rescue, which we're experiencing right now with Ukrainians. So Josh, we're talking about a moment in time that is not just now with the Ukrainian rescue, but where a lot of people on Zionism spoke about, well, is it Zionism if Israel was just the end gathering of the exiles? If it was just a place because Jews had nowhere else to go? But Nefesh Benefesh, you changed that conversation, that Zionist conversation, tell me about it. I think unfortunately, since the creation of the state of Israel, people viewed Israel as a haven and not just, a, or a destination, but not a destiny. Uh, the destiny of the Jewish people is to be viscerally, viscerally connected to its homeland, either in the form of moving to Israel or supporting Israel from afar, but feeling in one's heart that there is a connection of the Jewish people to our ancestral homeland. And unfortunately, since the state of Israel was created and the ingathering of exiles and Zionism was based on a haven or a rescue or a refuge, unfortunately, Zionism was identified as that, solely identified as that. And when we created Nefesh 20 years ago, and when I say we, because Russell, you were there 20 years ago with us, when we created Nefesh 20 years ago, it was a, a paradigm shift that Israel is our destiny, that people with means and people can contribute, not running away from something, but running to, hitting the ground to contribute, to build their lives, to infuse Israel with their Zionism and their contribution. So part of fear that people have about the word Zionism is, well, is it all, if, I'm, if I don't make Aliyah, am I a Zionist? What, what's your thinking? I don't think Aliyah and Zionism is mutually exclusive. I think Zionism is a belief. A Zionism, Zionism is an ideology. It is the belief that Israel is our ancestral Jewish homeland. And we as a Jewish people either support it in many different ways. We can support it through projects. We can support it with moving there. We can support it ideologically. We can support it by just moving the needle of the Jewish people in calibrating that compass of directing our future within the Jewish people within the state of Israel. 
Well, Nefesh Benefesh, you, uh, uh, Rabbi, have brought to us that, again, back in the definition, the Jews are moving there by choice. How did you come up with that American Jews, let's face it, 20 years ago, uh, American Jewry wasn't talking about making the mass aliyah. It wasn't the conversation, yet you started that conversation as part of our Zionist movement that it was okay to talk Zionism and aliyah and to make it a place of choice. How did you come to that moment? 21 years ago, I was a rabbi in Boca Raton, Florida, and my cousin, who just celebrated his bar mitzvah, was killed by a suicide bomber in the beginning of the Second Intifada. And it was a wake-up call for me and my family. And I wanted to pick up Omos and continue to stand in his stead or to continue what he stood for in the symbolism of the life that was snuffed. And when I mentioned my desire to move to Israel to others, I expected people to say, you're crazy. You're leaving Boca Raton, Florida. But I heard something very different across the denominations. I heard, I also want to, but. I also want to, but the bureaucracy is hellish. I also want to, but how am I going to find a job? I also want to, but I have student loans. I also want to, but I don't know which community or which educational facility I should put my children. And I realized that the low number of North Americans moving to Israel was not indicative of a waning passion of Zionism or less of a, a connectivity to Israel, but that Israel always looked at Aliyah as what we just mentioned, as a Aliyah of distress and haven or people running away from persecution. But it never ca calibrated its compass. It never created the manual, never shifted its, its path to also collecting individuals or facilitating the aliyah of those who are not running away from something. And after much, much research, I realized that there was a major gap within the entire aliyah construct. And myself and Tony Gelbart and many individuals um, that were passionate with us at that time allowed us to create this new path. What's remarkable about this is not only it's the first wave and the greatest wave of North Americans to go at one time to Israel, but the beauty of this is that this is the first of many planes to follow. So you came to that, I mean, obviously you and your family had thought about moving to Israel, your Boca Raton, but moving to Israel was part of your thought process. You talked to others, they said, you know what, I would, but I want you, Josh, to give me a story of one, two families that you talked to who made Aliyah that were that great story of, of the Zionist circle and making Aliyah of choice. Where do we start? We're close to 75,000 people that we've helped move to Israel. Each story is unique and each story is inspiring. It could be from the 34-year-old Harvard physician with a heap load of student loans who moved to Israel, embedded himself in, in the army and became a physician for the IDF. It could be the, the Holocaust survivor, 90-year-old sitting next to a nine-year-old on a charter flight on a plane to Israel, both of them with goosebumps upon landing in Israel, one of them who never even considered the horrors of history and was born in a world that Israel always existed, holding hands with an individual that came from the horrors of history where Israel is a gift to the Jewish people and to mankind. So many stories, stories of fusing families together, siblings, multiple generations, year after year, seeing more family members at the tarmac, meeting their brothers and sisters and their parents and their or their grandchildren, um, bringing, reuniting families together. 
we've seen individuals move to the north and south, fulfilling not only their own Aliyah story, but modern day pioneering spirit of populating the periphery. We've seen clinics opened in areas because people came with their talents and wanted to give back to the Jewish people. We've seen high tech companies generated and employ hundreds of people because of one person with a dream moved to Israel. We can go on for the next few hours, Russell, but for the, for, for the sake of time, I'll, uh, I'll leave it to the other questions. No, but I, but I think it's so important, 75,000, and to our audience out there, you're talking about this Zionist movement are they 75,000 zealots? You talk about a Harvard grad, a nine-year-old, a Holocaust survivor. You know, and I think that people think about Israel, the wider audience. Well, you know, it's a, it's a lot of religious people moving there. It's people that can't wait to serve in the army to defend Israel. And they're just real zealots. But my connection to Israel is, is not that deep. So who are those people and, and who are their families? It's, it's really the entire spectrum of the Jewish people. It's a full representation of North American Jewry. Of the, the singles from 18 to 35, a majority of them are not Orthodox. From the families, 60%, 63% of them are from modern Orthodox families. They're coming from 48 states of America. They're representing denominations, age groups, family makeups. Um, I would say over 90% of them are college grads, hold multiple degrees. They're coming to with everything. They have a full future ahead of them in America, but they're choosing to take their talents and what they represent and to build Israel one person at a time. So you started 20 years ago. Um, we've had a, a million and a half Jews that came from the former Soviet Union before. We've had 85,000 plus Ethiopians move to Israel. Uh, people talked about the ingathering of Jews in the 1950s. People, the, the Jews that came from the ashes of the Holocaust were facing something today. Unfortunately, uh, with the situation in Ukraine, but we're facing uh, Jews moving to Israel, maybe not by choice, but a different kind of a Jewish community that you have been in the forefront of, of uh, preparing for. So tell us something what's happening today. Okay, a little background. Over the last 20 years, we've created innovations within the Aliyah processing and facilitation. And one of the innovations that we brought to the forefront was that individuals who came to Israel either that they were studying here or they had work visas or an extended pilot trip just to test out Israel. Instead of flying back to their hometowns, they decided to change their status here in Israel. And like the bureaucracy of moving from a different country to Israel, there's also a bureaucracy here in Israel of changing one's status. So we created an innovation of having a one-stop shop here in our office. That means that we have the biometric machines and we have the passport machines and we have the Ministry of Interior come to our office and help process individuals here. So it's all one-stop shop outside of the governmental offices. So we have all of the equipment already on campus. And that's already the precedent that we created. When the Ukraine war started in February 24th and there was a mass exodus from Ukraine, and many Jews amongst them going to the borders. And this effort to bring as many um, immigrants, Jews to, to the Ukraine, they were struggling. And I mean, they, the government was struggling. How in the world were they going to process um, these Ukrainian refugees once they arrive in Israel? Because the small offices that they have around the country, they felt were not equipped to handle the mass volume and also the innovations to process them quickly. So the government made a historic decision and they wanted to do two things, historic decisions in two fronts. Number one, they wanted to take every agency that dealt with this um, crisis, that meant Ministry of Interior, working together with Ministry of Immigration Absorption, plus the Prime Minister's satellite of Nativ, which helps determine eligibility of return based on a person's Jewish status. 
and they decided to fuse those three bodies into one, meaning that there will be one stop for those three components, which would normally take months. If a person was making Aliyah from St. Petersburg, they would wait three months until they got their eligibility approved, come here, wait a couple of weeks to Ministry of Interior, and then another couple of weeks until they went to Ministry of Aliyah and Immigration. Here, they were condensing it, concentrating it into one place, and having it done within a couple of hours. That was historic decision number one. Decision number two was they were looking to do this off-site, to have an area to be able to fuse these three different bodies and to do a one-stop shop, you would have to create a facility. And instead of wasting time and creating a tender and to find out which location would be necessary and then moving equipment, they realized that Nefesh has that precedent, that historic you know, license. And not only that, but we also have the equipment. So they came to us and asked if we would take a portion of our campus and set it up for this mass processing for Ukrainian Aliyah to use our equipment, to use our office, to have our staff also to not train, but also be a supervisory um, support system for the clerks from Ministry of Interior and Immigration and Nativ, and to move this along. And every day, every morning, our doors open at 8 a.m. and there is a shuttle from one of the bus, from one of the hotels that are holding and hosting the Ukrainian refugees, and they come here every day, and we process close to 150 Ukrainian refugees daily, and this has been happening um, since a couple of days after the Ukrainian war began. There are only two sites in Israel: one in the north and ours. The one in the north is quite small. We are the main headquarters for the processing. They're thinking about maybe opening one in Tel Aviv, but most of the actions happening in the center of the country and in Jerusalem. There are 10 hotels right now in Jerusalem that are hosting Ukrainian refugees. as students who aren't necessarily Jewish, getting to go on Caravan for Democracy allows us to speak in a way to the nuance of Israel. So 20 years ago, innovation talking to people about a new Aliyah, but making it accessible for all people, you have been able to sort of be on the forefront to making this Aliyah happen, uh, yes, in, in, a, in a terrible moment in time, but allowing people to have that choice to have Israel as a place to live. It's a perfect example of a public-private synergetic relationship. We came onto the scene saying, let us help you accomplish your cause. And at that time, 20 years ago, it was helping the Goldblatt family from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, move to Israel. And over 10 years, then the government realized the talent that we were bringing to the country. And then they started using or leveraging Nefesh Benefesh for national causes. Can you help us um, develop the periphery? Could you help us bring high tech? Could you help us bring physicians because there's going to be a medical shortage of physicians in the coming years. They were leveraging the human capital and the individuals and the talent that was coming through our organization to Israel. And this is just another illustration of that public-private synergy. Uh, it might not be the people that we're bringing to help national causes, but it is the innovative startup nation kind of mindset that Israel is bold enough and humble enough to say, you know what? You guys have a recipe for success. Let's leverage it for this crisis. And it's a departure. It's a major pivot because it's a very different audience of, of Olim. We're talking about Olim out of crisis of a war um, versus Aliyah of choice, which we've been involved in for the last 20 years. But the processing and the mechanics and the innovative out-of-box thinking um, is very much the same. And it's being leveraged and utilized for a very different population. 
So I want our audience to also understand our ancestral soil, uh, the place that is the homeland of the Jewish people. When that nine-year-old arrives, when the 92-year-old arrives, when your Ukrainian family uh, comes to be uh, uh, absorbed and become an Israeli citizen, day one, are they on the medical system of Israel? No, I, they, they are covered right now. It's, a, it's, it's an interesting, complex question. Um, right now, they're treated as refugees, and they are being processed as quickly as possible to become immigrants so that they can follow in their regular immigrant path. That means when you become an immigrant, you get automatic health care, you get financial basket, you have certain benefits. So for the government's interest, so that there is some kind of organized process and an organized semi-future or semi-organized future for these refugees, it is in everyone's benefit to process them as quickly as possible so they become immigrants and then they can start their lives. The question that everyone has is what happens post-war? Um, where do they stay? Where do they settle? Do the fathers, husbands, brothers come and join them here? Do they go back to whatever is left of their hometown? And that's, that's the big question that's looming over this entire cloud. So again, there is that partnership though that when they become an immigrant of Israel, they become part of the medical system, they get their financial package, and that starts for day one, whether they have contributed one penny to the Israeli society. So the Israeli taxpayer is welcoming them home, not only in their homes, but they're financially as well. 100%. And the outpouring love that this country is demonstrating, either from bringing food, to the hotels where the Ukrainians are staying or doing clothing drives throughout the country. There is an understanding of what is happening. There is understanding of the depth of this historic crisis. And there is a deep appreciation that they are our brothers and sisters and that no matter what, we care about family. So that uh, is it, such a fascinating uh, point because people depict Israel as this military country and you know if there's the ingathering of people it's only for the military. Here are people that financially at the end of the day it's going to cost every Israeli taxpayer uh, uh, something for them to absorb these people. On top of that they're welcoming into their homes and because of Nefesh Benefesh and uh, our partnership with Jewish National Fund USA as well we are trying to set up the north and the south of Israel for, obviously, we were working on American Olim, which we will still have, American new arrivals. But we have sort of set that kind of groundwork for this, this population to have a place to call home. And 100%. And, and Russell, there, when I'm spending time every day going to the center, because it's on our campus, and with a translator, meeting a lot of the families, most of them are the wives or the elderly. And they're coming from backgrounds, professional backgrounds. So it's not that we're absorbing a third world country with third world degrees or, or and trying to find them and making them bus drivers or, or working in the field. They're individuals that come from a professional background. Um, yesterday, I was speaking to an individual, and he was like, I'm a famous dentist. I'm a famous dentist. I had, I had multiple clinics. And when I left my home, I took two things, a jacket and my degree off the wall. He said, because I'm going to work here in Israel. And I realized, and I already understand and anticipate that I'm going to have to get relicensed. But it'll be impossible to get relicensed if I don't have my degrees. So those are two things that he took, his coat and his diploma off of his wall. Um, and, and for that moment, you understand the, the, the intensity of the crisis. You can understand and can't even fathom, can't fathom, that if you were had a choice, if you had five minutes to leave your house before it was bombed, what would you take? And what's going through a person's mind? Just warmth and his future, present and future, which is mind boggling. But it also underscores that these are individuals, our brothers and sisters are coming with means that they can also contribute to Israeli society. It's not going to be a drain. 
it's going to be a tremendous challenge of making sure that they can integrate and feel pride and also heal through this crisis and through the war and make sure that they're given opportunities, opportunities that are jobs, professional upward mobility, or just placement. Upan, they have to learn Hebrew. Schools for their kids. I've had two kids literally 10 feet away from my, from my door who have been playing chess on the floor the entire day because their parents are being processed. Uh, these kids have to go to school. So there, there are so many challenges and so many pieces to this puzzle that, that have to be addressed to make sure that they're not refugees for life, that it is episodic, and that they could also be integrated and be full-fledged citizens of the state of Israel. So Josh, in 2013, you talk about the miraculous moment of our life. And 20 years ago, 21 years ago, you were hit with a, a, a personal tragedy uh, that led to you beginning an organization, Nefesh Benefesh, Soul to Soul. You know, leadership, taking that Zionist step is, is, is so difficult. And I know the challenges that you have been over the past 20 years, and, and now I'm listening to you talking about how those challenges have literally made a difference in, in people moving to Israel today. You talked about also in the past that there was no room for Zionist apathy. So I want you to talk to our audience, give us that, that person out there. Why is this moment of Zionism so important and why is there no room for Zionist apathy? I like that phrase, Zionist apathy. Sometimes history is being written and we're not even aware of it. And we go on with our lives or we're subject or victims to the power of inertia within our own lives and don't open and perceive and observe what's going on. Um, the history books and the Jewish people's history is always going to be focused and the epicenter is going to be always Israel. And there's some moments that are jarring that, that shake us to observe that history is happening uh, literally right under our noses. And sometimes we're apathetic because we just don't know. And apathy is sometimes a result of just ignorance. But here we have Zionist moments, historic moments, that don't allow us to have the luxury of being apathetic. It requires us to make a decision. It, it, when you're reading the news and seeing the news and seeing horrors on, on, on the screen, apathy is not an option for humanity. You have to decide, will I roll up my sleeves and be a participant of history, or will I ignore history? Um, I think apathy is a little bit passive. I, I think when you have historic moments, you're actively choosing whether or not you're being involved or actively choosing whether you're not whether you're going to ignore history unfolding. So it's it's apathy with a capital A. If we turn our back at historic moments, it's apathy with a capital A. If we don't roll up our sleeves, it's apathy with a capital A. If we don't see these moments in history and want to get involved and getting involved can be translated and manifested in a whole host of ways, in a whole host of ways. But it can't be that you just flip the channel or turn the page when you're seeing history being unfolded in front of us. Rabbi Josh Fass, thank you for writing history. Thank you for not at all ever allowing leadership and all the difficulties of it to knock you down, to slow you down. Thank you, Rabbi Fass, for writing the next chapters of our Jewish people, our bridge 
people to people, to the land, to the people of Israel, in Yerushalayim, we thank you and we thank Nefesh Benefesh. Thank you so much, Russell. A privilege and pleasure. To watch this and all of our past episodes, go to ZTV, our Zionism Studios YouTube page, and subscribe to get notifications.